Right, what's up guys? So welcome to episode five of the Bodybuilding and Business Podcast. And today I'm extremely excited to be having Simon Watson, the owner of Watson Gym Equipment, on the podcast. So welcome, Simon. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Not a That's problem great. whatsoever. It's, it's actually funny because when I had this idea of actually doing the podcast, um, was at home training. Yeah. I find that that's when I come up with most of my ideas when I'm doing cardio or when I'm training. And I said to Lucy when we're training, I said, do I really want to do like a podcast that's a little bit different because there's so many fitness and bodybuilding podcasts out there and they're always based on macros, training, and sure. yeah. it's very repetitive. And I said, I would love to do one, but tap into more of the business aspect of the fitness world. So people have had a successful business within the bodybuilding and fitness community. And the first guest I said, I was like, I would absolutely love to get Simon Watson on from Watson Gym Equipment because I've been a big fan of Watson Gym Equipment for so long. And obviously I know you're quite local. So literally you were the first guest that I had in mind. So I really appreciate you coming oh, it's on. It's great to hear. Thanks for, thanks for having me on. Not a problem. So I think before we obviously go into, you know, the, the detail in regards to, um, you know, the, the gym equipment itself, just quite interested to know a little bit of background about yourself. So more in regards to, you know, your life prior to obviously building this empire that we're sitting in now. Yeah, okay. With um, I left school at 16. Okay, yeah. Um, wasn't amazing at school, didn't really do anything significant, and probably any of my teachers would have said I probably won't amount to anything okay. incredible, which is maybe what, what drove me a little bit. But left school at 16, and I started an apprenticeship in aeronautical engineering. Okay. So I was working at a place called Boscombe Down, where they test um, military aircraft. Yeah, Boscombe Down, yeah. Various testing. So I did, did a four-year apprenticeship there, uh, 16 till 20. And then I stayed on for another four years. So I was there until 24 and got really good, um, a really good engineering kind of background and understanding. They... It's quite mundane, the things they teach you, but it really, it really grounds you with good engineering knowledge. Okay. Yeah. Um, which at the time I couldn't really see the value in, but later years setting up this, I realized yeah. how important that was. So um, I was there till I was 24, then I went traveling for a couple of years to the usual um, okay, yeah. Middle East, um, uh, Australia, US kind, nice. of, kind yeah. of thing. Um, then I came back at age 26. Yeah. And I got a job in Chippenham, uh, okay, yeah. um, big caution actually, the, yeah. uh, working for a company that reconditions food equipment. So you take big industrial bowl choppers and yeah. uh, industrial food equipment, strip it all down, rebuild it, and then set it on. It was a smallish company, probably 12, 12, 13 of us. Um, and it was busy, it was a real busy, yeah. hectic company. So, and it was a lot of welding. So, so there I learned to weld. Okay. So you, Kind of use the engineering knowledge I had from Boston Dan, uh, learned to weld there. But uh, we were dealing direct with directly with customers a lot of the time. So the boss would introduce you to a customer. The customer would say what they what they need, what they yeah. want, and you kind of work with them directly, which gave me good business kind of absolutely kind of understanding. It was almost like you know the boss wasn't there. You were dealing directly with the yeah. customer, and you were. You were seeing what they wanted and then fulfilling um, fulfilling their needs. So um, three years there, getting a really good feel for, for fabricating and welding. And then I was kind of knew I wanted to do something for myself, didn't know what, but I, I knew definitely to work for myself would be, I was never really a team player, didn't like team sports. I like okay. sports where it was just me against yeah. everyone else. So I um, wanted to work for myself and then suddenly had this idea because I was always into my training suddenly literally woke up one morning and said, I know gym equipment. If I make yeah. if I make some gym equipment um, and can sell it and make some some extra money in my spare time, that would be an incredible thing to do. So as soon as I got that idea, I was hunting around trying to find um, find somewhere I could I could build stuff from. Then I found a tiny unit, small half the size of this office yeah. uh, in, in Chippenham. Um, bought a tiny welding set and a cutoff saw and then I just started started making, I didn't have any customers, but yeah. just started making some benches well, and okay. things, uh, put a little ad in a, in a um, national magazine, Yeah. start getting a few calls coming in, and then um, it just kind of took off from there, really. Perfect. So when you were into training yourself, what kind of training was you doing? Well, I, I, I used to compete cycling, I was big into okay. the cycling. Yeah. Cycling then, it, and it was time trialing, but short distance, like 10 miles, which yeah. you, 
in, in cycling terms, a short distance was more power based. Yeah. So um, kind of got to know that squats are important for, yeah. for power. So got into my squats and then through going to the gym, squatting, just really enjoyed training, like push myself in the gym. Sure. Um, so, so yeah, I was just, just doing basic strength training back then. So when using the gym tricks, normally people see, you know, when it comes to setting up a business, you kind of see a gap in the market, see a problem, come up with a solution, and then obviously create the, a business or a product to, to bridge that gap. So were you training the gym and you was using some equipment and you kind of thought, do you know what, I could do this better or... No, I'd love to be able to look back and say, yeah, so I, I can see <laughs> this, this gap and I, I sort of strategically planned, but I, yeah. I didn't. I just, I just thought, you know, there's benches here, they're a bit tatty. I, I could probably make a new one. Sure. Um, at least that was good. Yeah. And that, that was it really. There was no plan. There was no big, big plan. All I wanted to do was make really strong kit that wouldn't break. Yeah. There was, um, I, I could sell it a good price, yeah. not stupidly expensive yeah. and still make a little bit of money. So now I could reinvest and, sure. and make some more. But yeah, there was no, no big plan, no business plan okay. or anything. It was very, very small, low so, key. So when you woke up that morning and thought, do you know what, I want to do this. How long was that process from that moment to then actually? To, uh, uh, I, I think it was a long time ago, but I think less than a month. I remember okay. desperately hunting around trying to find, key, key was to find somewhere I could work from. Um, so finding the place and I, I think once I found it, I could get the key literally within a week and yeah. it was, it was a tiny place and it was 500 pound for six months rent, wow. including electric. So yeah. I showed you how small it was Yeah, and it was like one socket on the wall. Okay. So I had 20 adapters coming yeah. out of this thing. That wouldn't pass running, these days. Running, <laughs> it wouldn't, no, it wouldn't. Um, but a tiny, tiny place, but it was, yeah, probably a month from getting the idea to actually having this little Sure. Half, half garage that I was working from. And, and at the time, did you were you still working in your previous job? You did it on the side? Yeah, or? so I was still working full-time at, at this company. The company was really busy. They expected and wanted you to do a lot of overtime yeah. constantly. Um, didn't like people doing things on, their, on, on the side. And they got aware that I was in my spare time doing this thing. Yeah. It was now taking over my overtime. I was, yeah. I was kind of... Um, yeah, um, uh, spending most of my time um, planning my my own little business, yeah. which they didn't like, and it was causing a bit of friction. So then I thought, I know I take two weeks leave yeah. and really focus on the business, see if I can try yeah. and build it up into some, you know, get some orders in and build it up into something. And the second day I was off, I had a letter saying, yeah, it's not working, don't come back. Let's go. Oh, so, okay. So, that was it. That was okay, so you had no choice. I had to make a, to, yeah. to make a go of it. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. And do you think that motivated you because obviously you lost that kind of financial support from your job and that kind of made you push a little bit harder? Because yeah, I mean, back then I didn't, I just had a girlfriend at the time, no real commitment. So yeah. I was never an ideal time to start a business, but it was probably as good as you could get. Yeah. You know, I, I could scrape by. I had, didn't really have money saved, but I had a, yeah, enough to see me through a few weeks. So. Sure. So I wasn't really relying on on selling a certain amount of, of stuff immediately. Yeah. Um, I knew I could get by. Yeah. Can you remember the first products that you actually built? Yeah, I, re I recently um, came across a load of um, pictures because because back then to market anything, I didn't have a digital camera. It was probably ninety nine. Was probably just when digital cameras were coming okay, out. I think, yeah. So I had a traditional camera. So I'd make something take a picture, get go to Boots, get like 20 yeah. uh, copies developed, and then send those out to people to um, to see if they wanted to buy it. But the, yeah, I came across some of these old uh, pictures. So the very first product was a um, uh, a flat bench, just a completely flat bench. Yeah. Um, I sprayed everything then, and so okay, it yeah. wasn't powder coated, it was yeah. sprayed. So I sprayed it white, and I had a, a black um, upholstery pad on there. Okay. So right from the start, I was making upholstery, I was making okay, every yeah. every part of it. So it, it was a bench, and then I did a shoulder press bench, then I did an adjustable bench, and then there was a customer in the New Forest who um, who ordered a leg press. Okay. And, I, and I'm pretty sure it was about £450, I said, I charged yeah. for it, and he paid me £200, and I said, I'll get it to you within two months. And then okay. I had to like desperately find how to make a, so I had no yeah. idea how to make a, a leg press. I, I didn't have any um, 
any CAD software or anything to, yeah. to produce it on. So I did little sketches and, and it was really trial and error. You kind of make something, cut it apart again, tweak it and change it. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so in, those, in those early stages of your start, and obviously now marketing, I'm not going to say it's easy because social media is still challenging, but you've got the ability to market so much easier. It's very, it's very different. Before. Yeah. In terms of marketing now, you, you can start a business and immediately look like a big professional yeah. setup and reach, keep like really specifically reach people very easily. Yeah. That, that's good. That's easier. But now it's much harder because everyone's doing what, yeah. whatever idea you come up with now, there's 20 other people doing yeah. it quicker, faster. So it, it's harder to actually probably get things off the, but to, to get your head above everyone else yeah. now. Absolutely. But in terms of quickly reaching people, it's definitely a lot easier now. I mean, back then, you, like I said, with the pictures, some, somebody would call up. I'd say, right, I'll send you some pictures, what we do, because yeah. there was no website, obviously. Yeah. So they, you'd, you'd have to wait two days for them to get the pictures. Yeah. Then you'd call them up again. Did you get them? Do you like what you see? Yeah. You know, it, it was just a slower, slower process. So what, what, what kind of things did you do in the, in the early stages to try and you know, grow, grow the market and get more customers? One, one thing I did a lot of was to make things, because I was making things that haven't actually sold. I was sure, just okay, making yeah. things to, to prove to myself that I could, I could make them and practice, yeah. you know, just practice the, the new trade. Um, so quite often what I do is make something, drive around to local gyms and yeah. say, look, let me just put this in to your gym. Just, yeah. just use it for a week. I'll come back next week. If you don't want to buy it, I'll take it away. No, yeah. no problem. Knowing that once they put it in and all their clients get on yeah. it and use it, they, they're not really going to want to yeah. take it out. So then it was a case of going back and just negotiating some deal that we were both happy with. Absolutely. So that got loads of kit out the door into places. Yeah. Um, and then on top of that, marketing just carried on my little, my little ad in the show sure. mark magazine carried on so there was it was getting to a point where most days i'd have a couple of calls come in yeah um this is probably six months a year down the line so it took, took a while yeah but um a couple of calls and i'd follow up and follow up on on everything you know, yeah you just completely follow up until they either bought or told me to yeah off. <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah and it just very slowly built but very up and down because because it was just me for at least two years yeah um you you get an order. I remember if I had an order for like three or four machines, that was a that was a big order. I had to really yeah. focus on making it, yeah. then deliver it. And in that time, you're not following up so much. Yeah. So you make it, deliver it, and then get the money. You think, great, I'm you know I'm rich yeah. now. <laughs> and then two days later, all the money's gone on on, on yeah. the parts and things, and you're starting again from scratch. It was it was very very up and down. So, so how long was the process of you being a one-man band to thinking, John, actually, I can make this into a really big scalable business? Oh, scalable years, probably, probably 10 years before. Okay. Probably 10 years. So, so into the second year, I started taking, I took on one, one guy who was with me for, who was with me for a couple of years. Um, between, yeah, so after a couple of years, took on somebody and then somebody else. And for a long time, there was three of us. It was a team, yeah. team of three probably up to six years in okay. as a team, team of three with maybe one or two others that came in when we needed, when we were yeah. really busy. So it ran like that for a long time. And um, it was only really when I started getting into marketing and, and yeah. understanding business, reading and learning about business. Because I think, especially in the UK, loads of people just seem to think that um, business is different to anything else. Where it's, business is a skill you learn, like a language. Or, yeah playing tennis or anything you know and, and if, if you with, with anything if you speak to people who have done it and are good at it or you go to seminars or you read books then you you get much better yeah so at that point sort of six seven years in i started reading loads of books uh going to seminars paying money to go to seminars yeah. and then looking back now you can see how it just ramps up so Absolutely. so quickly then yeah. so, so when it comes to obviously recruiting like you said there was three of you um, so what kind of skills were you looking for to try and develop a team? So I know a lot of people say that ideally you recruit around your weaknesses. Um, was there any kind of tactics in regards well, to the first team? One members? thing I know is def definitely helped me get to where I am is, is doing everything initially, doing the yeah. accounts myself, doing, doing everything, the marketing, yeah. everything. Um, so generally back then, anyone I was taking on was to help me 
because most of the time it's taken up actually making there's only so yeah. much stuff you can make in a, in a week yeah so um anyone i took took on them was a welder or fabricator yeah. or somebody maybe deliveries helping with deliveries yeah but certainly nobody offers space i wouldn't trust anyone back then speaking with customers yeah. I, I didn't think they'd be able to just really do it as well as i was doing them probably yeah. wrong i know now wrong because we've got like incredible sales people now far better than me um so yeah really it was just people helping with the nitty-gritty of yeah. like, making things that that's what i was taking on initially but it was it was scary every because you you look at it or i looked at it the wrong way back then it was always an expense you take somebody on you think it's going to cost me you know twenty thousand a yeah. year and you, you're always worried about that rather than the way i look at it now is that person's going to bring this value or this, yeah. you know, this into the business and, absolutely yeah but it takes time i think you've got to go through a hard bit to yeah get to that point it's good that you've kind of done it all and walk the walk so you kind of know all the different intricate details of the business to then 100 and definitely even now like the machines we were yeah looking at i know how to run i do the training course on all these machines okay, so yeah. nobody can bullshit me on anything yeah. i know how long things take yeah and that definitely definitely helps i see so many people with biggish companies who, who are running the company and they if suddenly everyone went home and yeah. there was one order they had to get out they wouldn't know where to start yeah. whereas i could still weld something I could, yeah. I could run the machine and do whatever it'd be a bit slow but it's still doing and that that really helps because um you know what people are talking Absolutely. about when they're, when they're saying how long something's going to take yeah i think people respect it more as well that you've, 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 so, you've, yeah. you've done it you know you, you've, you've grown the business from literally in a garage with your welder to actually doing the first product so people can kind of respect that and buy into the brand a bit more because of that journey rather than just I think it helps. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely. so so when you was obviously at that point then of like skill in the business what was the biggest challenge that you found whether it was just like you know a lack of skill set that was something that you were unsure about in like you know growing the business what was the, the biggest challenge that you faced when trying to scale it um cash flow is always always a a yeah big thing early on when you're really trying to grow so i've always been into make some money and put it back into the business and, yeah. and, and grow it um but cash flow is always tough but the, the main thing probably with any business when you start scaling it and you're taking on more people is, is staff staff are, yeah are generally getting really good staff yeah. and for years we we'd be so busy so you're almost desperate to take somebody on so you've you know, you advertise a job, first person that comes in that can do the job, you kind of take on and then yeah. and then realize later their mindset isn't you know the type of you know, they're not the type of person you really want within the business. Their yeah. um their culture doesn't fit with ours, you know, their core values aren't the same. So now we spend much more time looking at the person rather than what they can do. And that's really helped. Yeah. Okay. Grow. But back then, yeah, dealing with staff issues yeah. was a big really big headache and um and something i found really hard was come knowing i had to kind of come away from the day-to-day -day order making myself yeah. coming away from that and, and go more into managing everything and, and um pushing us in the right direction that that i found really tough and and mainly because leaving work at night and going home but not feeling physically exhausted from yeah. you know, lifting steel all day long yeah. and making things it was weird, you know, you go home, clean your hands and clean it. <laughs> and you, you feel like, have I really done a day's work? I struggled yeah. with that for quite a, quite a long time. Yeah, um, okay. I'd, I'd struggle going back to you know, the, all the physical side of making yeah. things, but yeah. Well, it's heavy kit that, down there, isn't it? You yeah, yeah, it's surprising how fit yeah. it, it keeps you um, making stuff all day. But moving away from that and into, into the managing side yeah. was, was um, that, that was really tough. Yeah. Um, I'm a bad man and I'm not good at managing. I'm good at um, kind of seeing our vision, deciding where we're going to go and how we're yeah. going to get there. But the actual managing of people was never something I was particularly good at. So getting some key people that could could uh, manage everyone was, yeah. was um, one of the best moves like 10 years ago. Okay, perfect. So in regards to mistakes then, we're, we've all made them. So what would you say that you're biggest mistake has been if you've made one when obviously growing the business is there any kind of key kind of oh that was that was not a good move to make um yeah we made this we've made loads of i've made loads of mistakes um but they're kind of important because you know absolutely from, i yeah. can't think of anything specific um 
that I've done that really stands out. Just um, yeah, I need to think on that. No, that's think, fine. That's fine. Think, yeah. But there, there's nothing I regret. There's nothing I'd, yeah. I think. Why the hell do I do that? I mean, there yeah. is lots of things I do differently now, but I think I think we need to go through that hardship yeah, and exactly. things to to appreciate. The, the right yeah. way of doing things. And if you didn't make those small mistakes throughout right the way and, and learn from them and grow and develop them, you know, you might not be in a big exactly, position. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. exactly. Yeah. So when it comes to now, obviously the processor, you've got a, a huge infrastructure here now. So when it comes to, you know, you know, this is a new bit of equipment that we want to bring out, what does that kind of process look like now? Because obviously I imagine at the start it was all yourself, you know, actually I want to make this bit of kit or somebody's ordered it, mm. you figure it out and um, obviously put it to practice. So what does that process look like now? Is it is it yourself or do you have a team of people? Do you get people in different gyms and go drop this bit of equipment? You know, maybe we could do this better or there's a gap in the market for a new bit of equipment. What does that, that process look like for mm. developing a new bit of equipment? It's still, it's still me that I do all the design. It's just okay, me, yeah. me that does the design. Really good team here. So once I've got the design, I can give it to them and they yeah. do get, uh, get all, all working. But um. In two, in much harder, obviously, at the start because I haven't made anything. Yeah. And so my skill set was much lower then. And also, I didn't have the 3D modeling and things that yeah. we've got now. So it's much quicker and easier now in terms of my skills a lot higher and the access I got to really good software yeah. makes things much, much easier. In terms of what we're making, it's a combination of us here deciding what would be another good thing to to bring out and customers yeah. and um, people like Ben Pekowski, yeah. about this, I speak to a lot and, and kind of suggest things we can do yeah. better and, and, and improve because we can always, definitely always improve. I never want to be kind of thinking, yeah, we've nailed this. Even, I mean, our dumbbells set myself, they are the best dumbbells yeah. you can buy in the world, but I'm always looking at ways of making them better and improving yeah. so we don't don't rest on our, on our laurels at all. But um, yeah, I'm always listening to feedback and and encouraging feedback from customers because yeah. so you deliver stuff and customers love telling us how great it is and it's yeah. really good to hear that. But we do try and draw out any you know what could have been better. Yeah, okay. and generally, if you ask people you know what could have been better, they're more inclined to um, to um, give you some good feedback rather than was you know, was there any issues. You know. That, um, so yeah, we take on board any anything there and um, improve not just the actual machines, but the yeah. processes, how things were delivered. You know, just just the whole buying Absolutely. process. All the I way think it, it gets people more like involved in the brand as well because you know if there's a machine and they've kind of noticed actually maybe this could be slightly better, yeah, you feed yeah. it back to the person that is actually in charge of it, yeah. and then maybe you make those tweaks. It kind of makes them feel like they're really involved in the process. Yeah, exactly. As well. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. One thing I've learned: you can't keep everyone happy. They, there's all you have machines that so many people absolutely love and yeah. people you genuinely know would give you yeah. other feedback if it was the case but they love it when you get other people just don't get on with it at all yeah. you know so you it, yeah you can't keep everybody yeah. happy but biomechanically everybody's slightly different exactly. anyway, aren't yeah, they? Exactly. so you're never gonna be able yeah, to yeah. make one bit of kit that is the perfect movement for every single person because yeah. biomechanically people people yeah, move exactly, differently yeah. you know people's mind muscle connections people have got the, the ability yeah, exactly, to do yeah. it or not which so. is why a lot of machines now over the last few years we bought in you know pre-moving arms yeah handles that rotate just just yeah. everything so you can it, it's given you roughly the path you're going to be yeah. using but then you can fine tune it to suit your, your own biomechanics yeah. absolutely so obviously your relationship with ben i'm a huge bodybuilding fan so you know i was a bit a big fan of ben's growing up he actually i met him at mr olympia it must have been about five years ago and he's walking yeah. past me and i was a bit like starstruck yeah. so i was like hope you don't mind me asking but can you give me some top tips on how to train cars because mine are stubborn <laughs> and i actually stopped there and give me the time of day and actually had a chat with me then the middle of the olympia and it kind of taught me about you know rotating my ankles inwards yeah. and focus yeah. on push up the ball on my yeah. feet yeah. And ever since I've done it, still haven't got great calves, but they're not as bad as they were. So <laughs> Ben's, Ben's got, I was in, I was in Bath with Ben the like, year before last. Yeah. Uh, just walking through Bath and a guy just, you know, we were deep in conversation and a guy just comes, oh, Ben Pekowski. Yeah. And Ben could have easily said, oh, hi, you know, quick pitch and walked off. Yeah. He spent like 10, 15 minutes yeah. chatting to this guy. He's, he, he genuinely wants to give yeah. He's very his, personable, his knowledge he? and yeah. 
and the information out to people. So really, really good guy and so knowledgeable. He yeah, he so is massively. Scientific, the way he looks at everything. So how did that relationship start then, the, then with you and Ben to obviously for help? Because I know he helped develop some bits of equipment, didn't he, which was mainly the bench, is that right? Uh, the first, yeah, the first product we did with Ben was, um, I think the, yeah, the narrow bench yeah, yeah. so you can retract your scaffold. Because you took that to the body power, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, before that, though, we took it to the Arnold Classic the year before. Okay. So I first met Ben in Melbourne. Um, it would have been the uh, 2015, maybe, Arnold, okay, Arnold yeah. Classic. Um, Charles Polycrum was there as yeah. well. I mean, that was such a great show. We had Ben was on our stand, Charles was on our yeah. stand. We, we had people queued just with quite a small stand, but it was the busiest, yeah. fuzziest stand there. It's really incredible time, that was. Um, and spent loads of time chatting to Ben and Charles. Um, of just about various products, how we yeah. can improve things, what new things we can come out with. But that's when I first met Ben, and then always stayed in touch from then. And, yeah. And um, yeah, got, got to know um, a lot of his, his um, sort of scientific ways of, yeah. the way he's very much into grounding any machine to the more you can be grounded into machine, yeah. like locked down. Yeah. So you're only moving with the parts you want to be moving and moving. So I saw his review on the um, on like kind of like the pronated um, row bench. Yeah, and yeah, he's talking yeah. about like the force versus force. So the, you know, the more you're able to force your obviously chest and your body into the pad, it allows yeah. them to yeah, do the yeah. force and contract the back a lot better. So yeah, yeah exactly. Was, was watching yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, that's very good. Yeah, I always thought before Ben, I thought I had a, built up a really good understanding of biomechanics, and I could look at machines and get a really good idea how yeah. how they operate. But then when you speak to Ben, it's just different. Different okay. And you realise there's so much more to learn. Yeah. You know, it's, so it's when, it, when it comes to bringing out a new piece of equipment now, like, what is the process in regards to, okay, so I'm bringing out this new bit of equipment, um, you know, you, you've, you've got the idea, you've put it in place, it's been welded, it's there. Is, is it like a trial product, like a trial and error product? It depends, it depends what it is. If it's totally new, if it's something completely new, we put it into some gyms with people we know who can, yeah. can trial it. Gen generally, um, a lot of people train here, we know how yeah. something should feel. Mechanically, whether the machine is up to the task to, yeah. to last, we know that I can test that on software. I've got to show stress, you know, all the okay, yeah. um, moments of movement and things. We can check all that. So we, we know the machine will last. So it's more a case of checking if it biomechanically works yeah. as it should, which we tend to do here. And then it may go into a gym with some people we know to, to test out further. Yeah. But generally then at that point, we sell it as that machine and, and um, it pretty much always it hits the mark. And, yeah, okay. You know, we might get feedback with um, something could be improved somewhere, which, which we then incorporate yeah. into a new design and either retro change the ones that have gone out or, yeah. or whatever, depending on, on what it is. Absolutely. So in regards to like, you know, that's been, been 12 months now during like the lockdown and the pandemic, mm. obviously there's been a, a, a bit of a shift in the fact that there's a real focus now on, on home gyms, home gym equipment, um, and obviously gyms have been pretty much closed for, I think about nine months of the past mm. year. So mm. how, how has that impacted on, on your company, either from like a positive aspect and a negative aspect? Have we seen like a shift in, in, in what people are yeah, buying? Listen, I think said before that our typical customers probably at slightly higher end yeah um jim so they with the initial lockdowns this is worldwide with the initial lockdowns they didn't panic as some gym owners did and sell equipment yeah. to, to bring money in which i know some gyms needed which you know is a real bad situation but generally our customers looked at the lockdowns as a, a way to um to invest in new kit so yeah. when they did reopen they were in a better place so commercially, we were worried initially we'd lose a lot of commercial orders. We run on a kind of three or four month lead time. Okay. So people pay a deposit yeah. and then they wait three months or so to, to get their order. So we thought initially, is there going to be a lot of cancelled orders? We're paying back a lot of deposit money. Uh, that didn't happen at all um, for those reasons because yeah. generally our customers thought, okay, we, we use this time well. And then on top of that, in the UK, the home market exploded. Absolutely, like, yeah. Massively exploded. So our, our focus was always, and our priority was always fulfill the orders. The, the customers have been loyal to us yeah. always, so commercially mainly, um, look after those, and then any spare capacity went into um, these new um, home 
people training at home that needed good kit. Absolutely. So then we developed a few machines to suit that market. Because it's not the home market isn't something we were ever massively into. Yeah. Um, we supplied good high-end home gyms, but um, if people wanted just cheap basic dumbbells, we didn't do anything like that. Yeah. So then we quickly came out with our eco plates. Okay, to, yeah. to combined with our uh, dumbbell handles, so people can quickly make up yeah. dumbbells up to any weight, you know, yeah. very, very compact, very heavy duty, but cheap, you know. Yeah. So, so we brought out some products like that to suit the, the situation. Absolutely. Because I know initially, like, getting dumbbells, getting weight plates, getting barbells, it was literally like, like unicorn dust. It was just impossible yeah, to get. Yeah, and the crazy product. Like, Argos stuff going for ridiculous yeah. money. So that kind of drove us to think, you know, it's, it's people take a massive advantage of yeah. that, which doesn't seem right. So, um, yes, yeah, so we just came out with some really good products that are cheap, yeah. you know, but do the job really well. Yeah. We, we had to market them as what they are. So I did a video on our, on our eco plates saying, yeah. you know, they are bare still. If you leave them in the rain, they're going to rust. You yeah. know? But, but if you just want cheap, good quality plates, yeah very compact, then these are perfect. Absolutely. So in regards to, if, you, if you're looking at kind of 2020 versus kind of 2019, did did the business grow because of the home market or decline or did it kind of level off? No, it's, it's growing. We, we're growing anyway. Generally over the last uh, eight years, we've grown between 30 and 35% year on year. Wow. So we knew we're growing anyway. We knew we were building the new factory and that was yeah. going to jump. So we we grow about 50% over this next yeah. year. It's a big, a big jump because of the, the sudden increase in capacity. Yeah. So we knew we were growing anyway, but this, we, we, we grew more than we thought, a, a bit more, but it changed um, order value dropped down a lot. Average order value dropped down a lot, Yeah. but more, more yeah. of them, which challenged, um, you know, paperwork side of things, our yeah. account systems, suddenly you're dealing with a lot more volume of orders yeah. for, for smaller value. So it, changed, it, it was a, just a learning curve dealing with, um, with doing things a, a slightly different way. Yeah. But interesting and really useful and, um, and good. Because in, in regards to the majority of your clientele that buy equipment, is it mainly like you know, your, your independent gyms? Because I know I've been to a lot of independent gyms it's quite common that I will see what's in gym equipment in there and obviously the home gym market. Is there any aspirations to try and go, when I say commercial gyms, it's more like your, your big, you know, multiple chain gyms. Yeah, no, we try and we, well, we do stay away from, the, we, we've supplied Fitness First okay, um, yeah. with, with key products, with, yeah. with products, specialist products, animal leg presses, that type yeah. of thing that they wouldn't get elsewhere. Yeah. But it's not our market, it's not where we want to be. We're, um, our typical customer is, is a privately owned yeah. gym or maybe a small chain of yeah. gyms, UP gyms here at Oscar Performance. Yeah. Um, that's more our typical um, customer, high yeah. end, independently owned gym or PT studio. Yeah. Or, or there's other markets are in as well, like the high end, kind of high net worth people. We do a lot of work there with okay. um, sports people and, and kind of the celebrity side we're trying to push because it's really interesting work. Yeah. It's all, it's all very bespoke and um, and different, so we're trying to push that as well. But it's a, a separate kind of kind of market. Yeah. But the bread and butter is um, it's privately owned gyms, yeah. and and our order book at any one point is at least 60, 60 to seventy percent repeat customers. Okay, people that have bought before. Yeah, that's good. I think a lot of the reason behind that is because normally it's people that own independent gyms usually have a you know. An, an interest in training themselves like exactly, yeah, every, exactly. every bodybuilder every fitness person you know including myself i'd love to one day have like my own private pt studio mm. um and you tend to find that you have more of an interest and a more of a passion of what mm. it goes in whereas you know i've managed you know large corporate changes for the past 10 years and they don't really necessarily I wouldn't say care, but they wouldn't really know the difference in regards to, okay, exactly. this chest press yeah, machine exactly. versus the benefits of a different chest. All they want is just one company to come in that can do an okay job of kitting out everything mm. at the cheapest possible deal. Exactly. That's why we stay away from the, the bigger companies because we're, there's only so many products we can make. We yeah. always, we, the, we've got no issues getting orders in. The, yeah. the issue for us is making it and getting it out. That's yeah. for a long time now being the issue. So there's only so much that we can make. So I want the stuff we make going yeah. to places where 
people really get the benefit and appreciate Absolutely, it. Yeah. I'd much rather that than just supplying some big, you know, corporate orders. Yeah. Where it just kind of gets gets lost there. I wanted to, you know, have that that going right back to when I started. The, it was just such an exciting thing to make something and then see people using yeah. it and and like really benefiting from it. That's yeah. such a good feeling. I've still got that now, so I still want to make sure the stuff goes to the right Absolutely. place and, and gets used in the way it should. Yeah. And I think, you know, what one said just for me spending time here today and, you know, you, you, you give me a tour of the place, you've still got that real passion for mm. good quality gym kit. It'd be very easy now to sit back, pay somebody else to run the day today, but you're still in here, walking the workshop, yeah. testing the kit, and you can tell when you're talking about it, you're talking about the different products that, you've got that element of passion and excitement. And I think that is what kind of sets you apart to a lot of other people that just want to make a quick buck off that. Yeah, it's, yeah it, I, I love the job. It's, yeah. it's incredible and making new products and seeing and getting them made. It's, it's really exciting. It's really good. So you know, sometimes I have a day off and there'll be something new being made and I know it's going to be made, <laughs> powder coated and yeah. going out quickly and I don't want to miss it. Yeah. So I'll come in just to yeah. see it and try it. So Absolutely. yeah, I really, I, I, it's the best job in the world. Good. Good. And if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. everything's easy. Then. Yeah, so exactly. we're obviously in, in, in the growth, obviously, you know, like you say, you know, you're growing, you know, 30, 35% each year. Was it like a pinnacle moment that you remember or a pinnacle year where mm -hmm. you absolutely exploded or was it gradual? Because for, from, for me as a consumer and someone that absolutely loves training and gym equipment, I think I kind of came across Watson initially was through obviously following Ben. Um, and you was at the Body Power one year, and I remember Ben was there when he was kind of uh, yes, yeah. showcasing the new bench that you had, yes, right. um, and Tom Blackman actually had yeah, that yeah. in pretty soon at Ministry at Fitness in Bristol, and I used to train there a lot. Um, that must have been 2000, I can't, I'm trying to think, 2015, 2015. You would have yeah. been, yeah, it was around then. Yeah. It was around then. So can you, was, has there been like a pinnacle point where like you've exploded or you've kind of made more than the 35% growth. It was definitely steady. when I said about learning about business there, I did a seminar. Um, it probably would have been 2009, 2010. It was called um, um, Renegade, Renegade Millionaire, I think. It was okay. Um, it was, I can't remember who, who it was. No, it was, um, it was an American copywriter, Dan, uh, Dan somebody, I can't remember his name. Very well known at the time. Okay. American copywriter. Um, and it was a three day seminar in London, just teaching you about kind of how to view your business and, yeah. and what you should be focusing on and loads and loads of mindset, just like loads, yeah. loads of mindset. And literally from doing that, things just started happening. And I remember a few months after looking back and thinking, was it just chance all these opportunities have suddenly come up and we're, yeah. we're now quickly expanding or is it to do with that? And looking back now, hundred percent, it was my, it, okay, that yeah. seminar changed my mindset, got me thinking in a much bigger way. Yeah. And from then we, we started on a good uh, trajectory of uh, yeah. growth, you know, whereas before that it was just very up and down, growing by the first 10 years, growing slightly, but just very kind of yeah. up and down. And then suddenly, a strong, um, strong growth after that. I mean, it, it was really mindset. Yes, yeah. that's, that's what it came down to. So during that kind of first ten years, where it was a bit of a slog and a bit of a graph, was there any moments in there that you kind of sat back and thought, "Is this really worth it?" Or did you always kind of have that drive to grow? It, it was. It it wasn't worth it in terms of money. I mean, I made for ten years nothing. Okay, I'd, I'd made loads more money if I just went back welding. Yeah, but never once didn't want to do it. I just really loved it. I really yeah. I, I, probably at the time probably thought this is it for the rest of my life i'm not going to make money or anything but i don't care you know i'm just doing, yeah. what, doing what i enjoy um my dad died when i was young and he i remember he always used to say to me just um it doesn't matter what you do just do what you enjoy you know yeah. you don't have a stress yeah. life just do do whatever you enjoy so um yeah i'm glad i stuck at it because and you can see why most people don't yeah get to that point where their business actually takes off because it, for any business, especially now, it's, it's tough as everyone's doing everything. So yeah. to, to reach that point, you have to go through that really hard graft, you know, just years and years of just repetitive, same mundane yeah. thing. But um, but if, if 
that, that's why you choose something you enjoy. Yeah. And then you finally get through it and things get get easier, you know. And, and now it's nice. So really, I can come to work without stressing about it. You yeah. know, money, the, the money side is always the, that's like the stress that is proper stress. Yeah. Now we've got, you know, building factories and things. There's always stress going on. Yeah. It's fun and stress. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't yeah. get down. It's just, oh, I've got to sort that. I've got to go here. I've got to do that. Yeah. You know, you buzz around. Just saying, it, it, it kind of feels like you're alive, you know, Absolutely. rather than the, the heavy stress of you know, sleepless nights, style of stress. But um, yeah, yeah, early on, it was, I, I didn't think it would really yeah. go anywhere big, but I just enjoyed it, loved it, just wanted to keep, keep making things. And so, what, what is the main thing that kind of drives you and motivates you to continue to keep building the business, building the brand, obviously expanding like you're doing? What, what is the main kind of key thing that motivates you? Is it to you know, have, have what's unknown, you know, well wired for forever? Or is it, you know, the financial gain? What is it that motivates the, the, you? The main thing is, is to, because we're limited, as I said, on what we can make. The main thing is to reach loads more people because you, all of us in here, we have our meetings and things and you kind of, you're so used to things. You think that every gym in the UK knows about us. And, yeah. But we don't. When you, when you go to a show, you realise the amount of people. Oh, I've never heard of you. Didn't realise that so many people. Okay, UK, we we're getting known now. But yeah. Australia, US, yeah, US, high, probably two percent of people in the US know about us. So okay. so we want to reach loads, loads more people. Want loads of people benefiting with products we make that nobody else makes. Yeah. And make for a really good price. You know, people getting massive value. We want to get that value to as many people as possible. That's what drives me. To keep expanding otherwise yeah. we, we just keep it contained as Absolutely. we are now but the expanding is something we need to do yeah. to be able to reach all those people yeah um i it's, i find it fun as well i enjoy um you, know, you build a factory and then you you go and look at equipment and yeah. you've got some things to, to put in there I, yeah. I enjoy that uh so it's fun but the whole drive behind it is to get our products to more people all over the world and and it's, it's a huge market and yeah. we're scratching the surface. Absolutely. Really, there's a huge amount more to do. I think the fitness industry is just absolutely skyrocketed. I think it's going to continue. And I think partly social media has got a big part to play in yeah. that because yeah. I, I remember when I was a young kid, you know, I grew up in Hull, so it was a bit more of a rogue area, but it was always like, you know, who could drink the most white lightning on a weekend? Who could do that? It was more that was like what made the alpha male when I was a kid. Yeah. But now yeah. it's like, you see young kids in gyms and on social media saying, yeah, exactly. who's got the best, best six pack? Who's got the, you know, the, the biggest chest and things like that. So there's a real, and it's great that it's moving in the right direction, but you're right. And although it's quite a saturated market, I think there's a big enough cake for everyone to have mm -hmm. a decent mm -hmm. chunk out of. Yeah, it's no, the way it is. And as bad as the, all the COVID situations been, I, I really think at the end of everything, governments are going to look back and think, okay, we, this obesity thing, you know, it, yeah. it, we've got to do something about it. And it, it's just going to help the industry, Absolutely. I think, long term. So what are your kind of long-term aspirations then for, for Watson in the future? Do you have any kind of milestones or any, like, um, you know, key achievements that you'd like to achieve? Well, or? I set goals all the time. I always spend my, my early mornings yeah. sort of reviewing and, and setting goals, seeing where I am with things. But, but it, it really is pushing out to more... There's certain countries we want to get more into. Yeah. The US is a big one we really want to push. Australia's great for us. It has been for a long yeah. time. We, we've got Australia nicely covered, but so we want to bring that more to the US and the Middle yeah. East as well, which is, um, we, we've struggled a bit in the Middle East. It's a different culture and getting big amounts of equipment in yeah. there is quite tough. So we want to learn more there and, and definitely grow, grow there. But US at the minute is a big okay. one we want to really So I watched, I watched a video when you said that you want it to be the world leaders in strength equipment. We're leading in, in strength equipment, yeah. definitely specialist strength equipment, which I think for certain products we're there. Yeah. And I want to just do, yeah. bring a, a lot more to that mix. Leg, leg equipment, very well known for. I think we do yeah. kind of really well there. Dumbbells, obviously, and now are weight plates. Yeah. Um, a few years ago, the plan was to, to lead in customization. I feel yeah. we're kind of there now with Absolutely, yeah. so many gym owners want their logo they yeah. want to push their brand so customization is really important i think we've reached that so so on, on that side of things is bringing more machines yeah. up i selectize machines i want to work a lot more bring those up to a, yeah to a higher standard and absolutely so i think with with those kind of multi-use equipment as well like you say with more pt studios now people working mm. and training from home mm. there's such a bigger market for us 
I don't really think anyone has ever really nailed them amazingly. I know if you go to a lot of hotels and you travel, they've got the kind of multi-use equipment mm -hmm. and you're never going to get it perfect. Don't get me wrong. It's never going to be as good, but I think that there's, there's quite a way that companies can go to make that piece mm -hmm. of equipment definitely. a lot better. Yeah, and you're right in the customization because you know, I, I absolutely love the Watson dumbbells. Like whenever I go to a gym and you see that they've got the, the Watson gym dumbbells in there, like with the branding on that, it just looks sexy is the best way to describe mm, it. Yeah, you know that they've got a passion for their brand and the quality of gym. Like, like my aim at the moment is I want a set of 55 and 60s with my logo on them and then eventually then getting the, the whole set because that is just going to be yeah, yeah, out of this yeah, world yeah. having yeah. it in there. I just remember then, so we, with um, a certain thing that changed, one of them as well was uh, Charles Bolloquin, who always used to recommend books to yeah. me. He recommended a book called The Pumpkin Plan. Okay. where um, it's all about going very, very niche, kind yeah. of everything, all the clutter, and just 80-20, basically, focusing on your niche. And yeah. that, that's something I did, again, back in probably 2012, something like that, cut out loads of stuff we were selling, yeah. focused on the key products, yeah. and that massively, massively helped. Then all your attention's on that, you know, that small niche, and you then become the experts rather yeah. than a company that does a bit of everything. You focus on that one thing, and then people come and you know, find you because you're the yeah. experts in that area. So you mentioned that in some areas you are world leaders at the moment. What what are the areas that you don't feel like you're quite there yet? And who are like your main competitors that that you might feel that are there or maybe edging you on a few? Yes, yeah, so there's companies. That, I, I think. With most of our products, in terms of value, because I always look at things with value, I, I yeah. think we do well with value. There's companies that make better selectorized kit. Um, Atlantis in, in okay, Canada yeah. makes some incredible, really good um, uh, um, prime fitness, yeah. used to be Stride, prime fitness yeah. makes some incredible products. But I still think in terms of value, what you're paying for, for the product, we're, we're there. But there's things I want to do to improve the feel and, and yeah. look of our mainly selectorized kit at the minute. I always think with anything you buy, there's like a like a curve that kind of flattens off at the top. So if you if you buy a push bike for two hundred pound compared yeah. to one for five hundred pound, massive difference. Yeah, five hundred pound to a thousand, big difference. And then a thousand to three thousand kind of flattens off. And then a three thousand pound bike to a twenty thousand pound bike, most people wouldn't even be able to tell the difference. Yeah. So I always aim for our products to be at that point where you get maximum value before it starts flattening off. And people are paying a lot more for not much yeah, more. Yeah, okay. So I always aim for that kind of top sweet spot there. Yeah. And I think on most things we are, but what's, what's helping is like the new factory and the robots and things we're probably yeah. bringing in is going to make the cost for us to produce things less, Yeah. meaning we can add loads of value to it without putting the prices up. Yeah. So we can, like for, for, we're at a good point where we're a small enough company, we can change and adapt really quickly. Yeah. But the, the facility we've got, especially when the factory is yeah. built, we've got an incredible manufacturing facility with state-of-the-art equipment. Absolutely. Normally companies with that type of equipment are so big, they can't change. They're, yeah. they're making their products. If somebody wants it a bit lower, so you can't, yeah. can't do it. We, 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 and, and I'm going to make sure we stay around that point where we can okay, change yeah. quickly but still be super efficient at yeah. manufacturing so then we can have even more value. To so you've got the perfect systems. balance of efficiency and I think flexibility. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Most other companies that can change quickly, it costs them a lot to make things because they're doing it in a very slow yeah. and you know, um, manual way. Absolutely. So when it, when it comes to kind of like prioritising like, you know, the overall aspect of the business, so if there's like the four elements that you've got, product being one, customer service being two, team being three, and then profit being four, how would you kind of rate those where you see the, the most or least important? So product, customer service, like the team and people, um, and then obviously profit. Well, it's hard because they all come together. Do you? Yeah. I'm certainly not money-based, like, um, but... As a company, we need to be making profit yeah. so we can reinvest. Yeah. So we're here in 10 years' time to look after, yeah. you know, and honor our lifetime warranty. So we need to be a profitable company. Yeah. But money's not a focus. So um, it really is a combination of all those. Customer service goes hand in hand with, yeah. with, with everything. Products, 
no matter how good you are at marketing, I see this all the time, companies so focused on their marketing and trying to reach as many people as they can. Whereas if they just focused on what they're offering, yeah. stepped up what they're offering, people would find them. You know, yeah. you, if you've really got to push people to, and have these 20 touch points before they actually buy, then maybe something's not, you know, your product isn't that good. Because if, yeah. you, if you're offering something amazing, to the right type of people, they will yeah, buy it. You know, if, if they're not buying it, you've got to you've got to think rather than look at your marketing and how can we change the wording. You know, yeah. look at your product because if you know, I know if I see something really really good and if the price is right on it, I'll, I'll buy it. You yeah. know, the only reason you don't is because it isn't as as good as what the people making it think think yeah. it is. You know, um, so it all go yeah, I'd say it all goes quite hand in hand. That customer service is really I'm I'm really really strict on yeah on how, how quickly we get back to people, making sure we're, we're listening to the questions. A few years ago, we had this, this issue where you'd look at some of our guys' responses to customers and, yeah. and they're not answering the question, you know? So we, we've had loads of meetings and things okay, now, yeah. everyone understands, really try and see what the customer's asking here yeah. and then answer them rather than having loads of emails back and forth. Because I know if I email a company something, it's just nice to get a good, Email, yeah. ask my question back. If I've got to go back again, I probably won't bother. I'll probably go, go yeah, somewhere else. Absolutely. So, customer service, looking after customers, we're very customer based, yeah. you know, customers. We, we pick and choose our customers carefully. We won't, we won't just sell to anyone. Yeah. But when we choose a customer, we're really glad our way to look after them. Absolutely. I think, I think one of the shows you've got in regards to customer service is that you're accessible as well. So yeah, yeah. A lot, you know, I, I'm dealing with a company at the moment, and you know, you've always just getting the messenger, relay the messages back. So mm. it, it's good that people have kind of got the face to, to the brand as well, which a lot of big companies, you know, a lot of you know other gym equipment companies, like you don't know who who who, who is the senior person or the owner. Yeah. On there. You want yeah. to kind of speak to the people there. Yeah, I agree. That's, the I think team. having the name as well is something that's accidentally helped. Yes. Um, because originally I was going to find a good name for the company, never did, kept it as yeah. and gym equipment. Did, did, you, did you have any other names that were kind of probably, probably did, can't remember now, but I, I remember spending time thinking, okay, yeah, what, what name should we give it? And then time went on, and then it became quite hard to change the name, yeah, to change all the bank and everything, yeah. So we thought, it just, well, I thought, let's just keep it what's in gym yeah, equipment, absolutely. Glad, yeah, it's worked, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. so in, in, in regards to like the future. Um, do you have like a, a strategy? So you know, are you looking to keep keep it within within the family business, or do you have any kind of future um, aspirations for the business, like an exit strategy? No, no interest in bringing anyone else in. It's just yeah. me, my wife's a, a director for tax reasons. No, she's yeah. not involved at all in the business. Um, would never want to sell. There's no plan to sell out yeah. for the company. I've got two kids. At the minute, they're not showing much interest in, in <laughs> coming here. One yeah. of my goals um, is to be 90 and still coming in, look, okay, looking yeah. around, seeing what's yeah. going on. I, I, I want to be, yeah. in, you know, just, just as it is now, but bigger. Um, yeah, no, no plans to sell out. Or and, and I think what you said then is, is so key and why I think your company is doing as well as it is because, you know, you'd be at the position very soon, or if not now, where there's enough money in the bank to kind of, you know, you and your family enjoy the rest of your life somewhere sunny. But the fact that you want to still keep working until you're 90 and you're so passionate about it, I think that is just key in itself. And I think that's why Watson are where they are now, and you know, mm. what, what it's yeah, going to be in the future, yeah. because you've got that passion to constantly want to be in the trenches, you know, wanting to be supported. Because, you know, as, as, as you know, the, the, the business grows and grows and grows, you don't necessarily need to be involved in the trench as much as you can. You can recruit people to do that. Mm, mm. And you can be sat on a beach somewhere enjoying a cocktail. But yeah, like you exactly. said, you've got that yeah. passion to, to come in when there's new bits of equipment and stuff like that. And I think that's so great to see. And I think that's what separates, you know, really successful businesses from, from, from the unsuccessful ones is, is the passion and the drive and the person that is obviously, you know, driving mm, that kind mm. of train forward. Yeah, so definitely. that's so good to hear. Yeah. I mean, thought of retiring, I couldn't think of anything more. Yeah. So, for drive my wife crazy as well. Are you quite an active person where, you kind of struggle to switch off. Do you always kind of need things to kind of keep? I need, your... I need things to do. When when we built this factory um, four years ago, it would have been. Um, I'd never built anywhere before, so it was, yeah. a, big, it was a big thing, real big project. And I remember at the end of it, when it was all done and we were in, I actually felt quite flat. Yeah. Um, so I walk, you know, obviously still running the business and everything. There's plenty to do there, but um, 
just not having a big project again. So it was exciting getting involved in the next one. Yeah. And this was easier. But I've got a product project lined up now with a few projects. One's our house. We're knocking our house down and we go the okay. well, But after that, we've got more land beyond the new factory. So we're going to carry on building down okay. there. So I purposely lined things up. So yeah. when that's finished, it's coming towards the end now. I'm not on a flat and uh, looking for something else. I've got sure. things ready to dive straight into. So yeah, I, do, I need to be doing things. Absolutely. Yeah. So what do you like doing when you're not designing gym equipment? What do you kind of like doing in your personal life? Like any hobbies? We travel, we love, love traveling. So we, we tend to also, we do breaks away with, with the kids. Yeah. Obviously love holidays with the kids, but we do also like my wife will go away on our own, even if it's a long weekend. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we like, we like getting away traveling and that's been tough the last yeah. year, you know, not, not, traveling so hopefully soon we can get back to that but yeah just just practical family you know, yeah got a 12 and a nine year old so typical family life keeps okay me, keeps me busy outside of here absolutely um i love cycling but i don't really get time to go for a cycle so i'll cycle to work and cycle yeah, home again okay, yeah then it's kind of absolutely make, make yeah. use of the time yeah um yeah that's pretty much yeah, pretty good well that has been an absolute fantastic conversation. And I just want to say thank you because you've taken the time out today to show me around the place and I might be a kid in the candy shop. I actually <laughs> love gym equipment. Like whenever I go to a new gym or whenever I travel, like I just get excited about playing with new bits of equipment. Yeah. Or see, I, I'm such a geek when it comes to gym it's equipment. It's a great industry because everyone in the industry, all our customers we deal with, they're all passionate. Yeah, absolutely. It's yeah. such a good industry to be in. It's yeah. really nice. Especially yeah. when you can deliver a product and you see the happiness yeah. that they get from using a bit of machine. And exactly. I think some people outside of the industry don't really understand it because when I was telling people about me coming today, I was like, oh, I'm going to a place where you know, they make this unbelievable gym equipment that yeah, I actually yeah. love. And I was like, yeah. Okay, but like, unless like, you buy into the whole fitness journey, I don't really think they, they, they yeah, get yeah. it. But no, it's been amazing. So thank you for your time. I really appreciate much. it. Appreciate you coming in. Not a problem whatsoever. Thank you. Thanks.